True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. The Schenecker family home was in a nice neighborhood, the kind of place couples choose to raise a family. Julie, her husband Parker, and their two children, Calix and Bo, seem to be living the good life in their spacious home located on a cul-de-sac in a gated community. But on January 28, 2011, the city of Tampa and surrounding communities were reminded that appearances can be deceptive and money cannot buy happiness. Join us at the quiet end for The Devil They Knew, the story of a mother who planned and carried out the murders of her two children because they were mouthy and disrespectful. Julie was a carpool mom, her husband was a colonel in the military, and their two children were good students who played sports and had a lot of friends. But behind the family's facade, Julie was a powder keg, with serious mental health and substance abuse issues. At the heart of this case lies the question of whether Julie was capable of understanding the consequences of her very violent actions, and how could her children have been protected from her? The beer for this case is from one of my favorite Florida breweries, Funky Buddha, and the beer is The Love Below. It's a Russian imperial stout, another heavy hitter, 12% alcohol by volume. So this beer is uh, black, a little bit of red highlights to it, has a small tan head. The aroma is that of alcohol, chocolate, sweet fruit, and a little vanilla. It's got a lovely taste, red wine, dark chocolate, sweet cherry, and vanilla. Remember those uh, cherries inside with the syrup and the the chocolate on the outside? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sort of like that. It's a medium-bodied beer, a very great sipping beer. Sounds really delicious, I have to say. It is, but, you know, we're going to have to split this one up with the other bar flies down here. 12%, yep. I think we should uh, share it with at least two other people. Yeah. Yeah. Can each have five or six ounce pour? That'll work. Probably. I'd drink more if it was like bedtime, but since we still have stuff to do, that sounds wise. You think? I think so. Let's open it up. All right, down here at the quiet end, why don't you give us uh, the particulars? Get us started here, Dickie. Okay. So Julie Schenecker was born January 13th, 1961 in Muscatine, Iowa. Now, this was a farming town, had about 20,000 residents there. Julie had an older brother named David. He was two when she was born. And two years after Julie was born, her little sister Carol came around three kids. Their father, Jim Powers, was an electrical engineer and a farmer. Their mother, Patty, stayed home while they were young, and then later on would sell real estate. It was a pretty comfortable upbringing in Muscatine. The largest employer in the region was Heinz, Heinz ketchup people. The downtown area didn't have much for kids to do, particularly teens, so they liked to hang out at the local pizza or ice cream place, and there was a lot of high school extracurricular activities. Yeah, and she really was involved in a lot of those as a child. She was very athletic, a good student, and a very pretty girl. She dressed well and stood out in her group of friends with long blonde hair, blue eyes, and a year-round tan. Julie was a real star on the track team and the basketball team. So when she graduated in 1978, she went to Cedar Falls, where she was enrolled as a student at the University of Northern Iowa. That fall, 1978, the student body on the UNI campus was just over 10,000, and 97% of them were from Iowa, so they weren't pulling in a lot of people from other places. Also, more than half of them were female, and there were just 210 African-American students in the whole student body. Julie majored in physical education, and she played on the volleyball team in the UNI Dome, 
I guess they called it the Unidome. Yeah, why not? And that was a new physical education complex that had been built just a few years before she went to college. So she seemed fine. She made friends at UNI, mostly with other members of her volleyball team. She was outgoing. She was fun. But she was extremely competitive in all aspects of her life. For example, if a teammate was slacking off, she'd let her know. If another girl was interested in the same guy as Julie, she would tell her up front, hey, back off. She graduated in 1982 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in physical education and coaching. So after she graduated, she enlisted in the Army, and Julie was sent to Monterey, California, which is just a beautiful area on the Pacific coast. So this was perfect for her, being the outdoorsy, sporty type. However, she didn't have a lot of time for exploring. She was assigned to the Defense Language Institute Foreign Language Center in order to learn the language and culture of Russia. So this total immersion language school allowed for the mastery of a language in just six to ten weeks. Julie had close to a full year of instruction because she had to learn the Cyrillic alphabet in order to be skilled in reading, listening, and speaking. The philosophy of this school is that in-depth language learning cannot occur without a complete understanding of the culture, values, religions, economics, and politics of the country. So the curriculum was focused on immersion for rapid learning of the language. It took place in a classroom, but also in real-life circumstances that could last overnight or even a few days. So when they went off-site for one of these immersion events, Julie was isolated from anyone who spoke English. Only Russian was spoken to her and by her. She would spend nights in settings designed to match the typical apartments in the Soviet Union. During the daytime, she was sent out to shop, make reservations, and do other mundane tasks in Russian. So that always impresses me when people can learn languages like that. Yeah, I know. I mean, even I know it's an immersion type of learning thing, but geez, six to ten weeks and you're fluent? Wow. Well, no, she was in it for almost a year. I know. If you were learning Spanish or French or German, yeah. Yeah. And that's crazy. You're right. I don't think I could do it. But after completing that program in Monterey, Julie was a Russian linguist. So she was assigned to real situations that impacted national security. In 1987, she was assigned to military intelligence in Munich, Germany. And in this position, Julie collected intelligence by interviewing refugees who were entering from the Eastern Bloc. She gathered technical knowledge by debriefing and interrogating these people in both Russian and English. For the National Security Agency, she looked over sources and documents and took part in counterintelligence and analysis. Now, Julie was pretty happy being in Bavaria, particularly because of the Stark Beer Fest, which is also known as the Strong Beer Festival. So this was an annual celebration of stouts and other dark beers that took place during Lent. These are hearty filling beers, and they were served with traditional Bavarian food. Soft pretzels, regional cheeses... German potato salad, sauerkraut, sandwiches on rye bread. She went back year after year, always having a blast and always walking home to sleep off those high alcohol beers. So that sounds like something we should try. I think so. I mean, I wonder if it's as busy as Oktoberfest. That's pretty crazy. It's probably pretty crazy, but it might be worth doing at least once. So Julie organized and coached a men's volleyball team of military officers, and she was good at that. She was very organized and very full of energy. She was a type A personality for sure, but someone in her line of work pretty much had to be type A, and everyone she was with in that department was a type A person. And it was as a coach of this team that she met her future husband, and that is Parker Scheneker. So a little bit of background on Parker. Edmund Scheneker and his wife Nancy settled in Fort Worth, Texas in the 1950s, and they had a son, Edmund Jr., in 1961, followed by Parker in 1962. Fort Worth was known for the tragic execution of John Kennedy, of course, and Parker was just one year old when that happened. So this was a really shocking event, which was felt really hard by Fort Worth residents, especially those who'd been there for his speech, which took place just hours before his sudden violent death. So for the Shenaker brothers growing up, Fort Worth grew from a sleepy town into a city with over $33 million in funds to build new parks, recreation facilities, 
police headquarters, and even a new city hall. In 1972, the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport opened also, and this brought in more corporate jobs, including American Airlines. But all of this growth and positivity was not reflected in the Schenecker family's home life. Parker's father was an alcoholic, pretty bad one, I guess, and that caused the boys to grow up walking on eggshells with their father. Growing up with that unstable behavior in a parent, Parker was determined from a young age that he would be different and his family would have it better. He set himself up on a path for a successful life, one where he would have his own family with children who loved, trusted, and respected him. So he always had good grades in school and excelled on the track team doing hurdles. In his senior year in high school, Parker was accepted at Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia, and he entered the university as a student in the fall of 1980 and joined the ROTC. So there were only about 1,600 students there at the time. And according to a former classmate, Eric Story, everyone knew everyone else at Washington and Lee, and just everybody liked Parker. He was a gentleman who showed dedication to his studies. He also played linebacker on the school football team. He graduated in 1984 cum laude, with a degree in French as a distinguished military graduate. Also, he received the Military Order of World Wars Award, and he was made a second lieutenant in Army Intelligence. So Parker went into the Army's officer training program at Fort Huachuca in Arizona. Located by the town of Sierra Vista, the closest city was Tucson. From there, in 1986, Parker was assigned to Munich as the aide to Army and Air Force Exchange Service Commander, Brigadier General E.B. Leedy. Boy, those Army people do like their titles. Yeah, it took me 10 minutes to go through that. <laughs> yeah. Now, Parker was serving in this position for General Leedy when he met Julie. So while he's in Munich, Parker was responsible for moving information between the commander and his military units. In 1987, he signed up for men's volleyball. And that's when he met his future wife. They had similar interests and similar goals. They began dating. They fell in love. They both wanted big careers in the military. So due to the Cold War, the military intelligence operations back then were focused in West Germany. Yes, so he stayed in Munich, but he was transferred to a group who primarily participated in counterintelligence. He was commander of what they called the Headquarters and Headquarters Company, HHC, and he developed life support programs for headquarters personnel, including food service, maintenance support, and internal morale and discipline programs. So this has been described as a group of elites for the elite. Located in a place where there were plenty of defectors, these U.S. Army interrogators could interrogate people every day. There was always somebody to interrogate, which was great experience for them. Now, in 1990, Parker left Munich for an assignment back in Fort Huachuca. So this meant that he and Julie were separated because she's still in Germany. During that time, Julie was diagnosed with depression. In 1992, she saw a psychiatrist and she was put on medication. But after Parker returned to Munich, she continued to keep her illness a secret from him. She was not going to tell him about it until after they were married. Yeah, and this would be kind of a point of contention because he felt like he was kind of set up for this. He did not know she had a mental illness when he married her. So I don't know how you feel about that, but I think it is kind of unfair. Well, I, I think you should have full disclo disclosure before you get married, right? Right, exactly. I don't know that that's... I don't know that that's that huge a deal, except that she's withholding something from him. Well, sure, but it becomes a big deal when her behavior goes off the rails. Well, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, if someone says, you know, I, I have some depression and I take medication for it, that wouldn't make me not marry the person. No, but also they're in the military and that's a little bit different, I think. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So Julian Parker married in October of 1992 in New Orleans. They had their reception at the New Orleans Country Club. Then the newlyweds returned to Bavaria and lived in the town of Vilsack. Two years later, Julie left the army and she became a full-time mom. Their first child, a girl named Calix, was born in September of that year. So then the family moved to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. 
and that was very soon after Calix was born. Parker was stationed there for intermediate level education, and this was a 10-month post-grad program with a curriculum including military history and planning and decision-making processes. So the program prepared field grade officers to command organizations. And his assignment there designated him as an officer rising very quickly in the ranks. He was a very serious person in the military. But soon the Shenikers had to move again, and this time they were sent off to Hawaii. His wife, who had been hoping for a career in the military, just decided not to do that. She's going to be a a mom. Yep. And I'm not sure how that decision was made. If she resented that. Well, that's why I was bringing it up. Or if she wanted that. We don't really know that. Yeah. Well, and and then you throw in the depressive symptoms, too. And maybe she felt that uh, being in the service wasn't what she wanted to do. Well, sure. A lot of people don't want to stay in the service. Uh, Even more so if if you have depression and you're just not sure of how things are going to be going. Exactly. It, It might be better to stay at home. Yeah, but I also think the moving was not good for her. Oh, I don't think it was. Someone at all. who's that seriously mentally ill is probably better off staying around a supportive group of people yes. who are nearby. That was part two of my comments, so you got it. I got it. So the new home for the Shenikers was on the island of Oahu. Parker was stationed at Schofield Barracks in central Oahu. Now the cost of housing was uh, pretty high. Oh, it's super high there, I've heard. So most families lived on the base. And officer housing was inside a gated community or gated area. Now, in September of 1997, Bo was born at the Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu. So on the surface, Julie, who's now a mother of two, seemed to have found real happiness. But in reality, she suffered from pretty severe postpartum depression after Bo's birth, and she was put on medication. Yeah, and you have to question there if maybe she had some postpartum psychosis because she was seriously ill, more than just being depressed or having the baby blues, as they call it. Yeah. And staying home with kids, that'll make you crazy anyway, to a certain extent, that's tough, especially with no support system. Yeah, these kids are, what, two, three years apart? Yes. Yeah. It's a lot. It is. Plus, you've, your husband's in the service, so he's not home a lot. Yep. You're, you're like a single mom raising two kids. Yes, and you don't know a lot of people because you're moving so often. Yeah. So when Bo was a toddler, Parker was assigned back to the East Coast. He and Julie didn't want to move the kids again, so Julie decided to stay with them in Hawaii for another six months. She answered an ad from a single woman who was looking for a roommate who could also watch her pets when she traveled. So this woman really hesitated to allow a woman with two children move into her home. But she would end up just falling in love with Calix and Bo. She said they were just really good kids, bright and kind. But Julie was a bit tougher to get to know. She seemed like a good mom who was very organized and kept her children busy with all sorts of activities. And she was friendly enough, but she never opened up or talked about anything beneath the surface. Julie always seemed upbeat and competent, though. And there were no signs of any mental illness, at least not to that woman. In 1999, Julie and the kids reunited with Parker, going to Woodbridge, Virginia. And from there, they moved again to Columbia, Maryland. So the constant upheavals were difficult for Julie and for the kids. Julie had left her career to support Parker and raise her children, but she was following Parker's dreams more than her own. And I just always wonder if there was some resentment on that. She was on medication, but this darkness of depression was always hanging over her like a cloud. Yeah, in 2001, Julie had her most severe bout of depression yet, and she was hospitalized for this. While hospitalized, she was diagnosed with severe depression, bipolar disorder, and schizoaffective disorder. She was an inpatient for nine months. It's a long time. They don't a very long time. They don't keep you that long for nothing. I wouldn't think. No. Parker hired a nanny for the children, and his mom, Nancy, came to live with them to help out. When Julie was discharged, she continued to see a psychiatrist and to take her medications. Her outpatient psychiatrist added unspecified personality disorder to her list of diagnoses. So getting medical care 
was really tough as well because every time she moves, she has to find a new psychiatrist, a new counselor. Yeah, start all over. And that's really hard to do. It's hard to find a counselor that you feel good with. And then you have to move to another town and try and find another one. That's tough. So then in May of 2002, Parker was sent back to Germany and assigned as a lieutenant colonel. Julie and the children moved with him. In the summer of 2005, Julie was starting to refuse to take her medications, just wouldn't take them anymore. So this is a common thing you hear about, and it's a dangerous occurrence for people suffering from bipolar disorder. Because the medications, even out the highs and the lows, can make the person feel flat and emotionless. So many people miss the highs. They don't like feeling all flattened out. And they'll reject the medication, saying, I just don't feel good on them. And of course, they don't realize when they're in a manic phase. No, they don't. They just think everything's great. So when the family moved back to the United States, they bought a house in Odenton, Maryland. As she delved into making home improvements, Julie entered into this six-month stretch of mania. Remember, she's off her meds. And her high energy not only came with euphoria, but also with some not-so-great things like agitation, recklessness, poor judgment, and a very quick temper. So Parker finally had to take her to Walter Reed Hospital for psychiatric treatment in early 2006 because she was so far out of control. Still, with all this going on that August, Parker was promoted to colonel. As a result, the family had to move again. Parker worked at the U.S. Army War College in Pennsylvania's Susquehanna Valley. He was enrolled in graduate study to master leadership, theory, and practice. The family settled into a suburban neighborhood in the village of Boiling Springs, and this was near a lake and along the Appalachian Trail. This new neighborhood was upper middle class and surrounded by working farms. The houses were between two and 3,000 square feet in colonial and modern styles, and the Schenegers' house was a yellow two-story colonial. The schools there were excellent, and the children made friends, and everybody seemed happy, at least for a time. At least for a time. The kids really seemed to flourish. Bo made new friends, kept in touch with old friends. He was a funny kid, kind, athletic, and he was just an empathetic person. Calix was the artist of the family. She took art courses. She learned to work with watercolors, acrylics, ink, and charcoal. In fact, she was so good that an illustration she did of her family was entered into the 2007 Armed Services Art Contest, and she won first prize. That was a $500 savings bond. Pretty good. Yeah, that's impressive. But even Julie seemed to be doing pretty well in Boiling Springs. She had a long period of apparent stability. Parker graduated from the Army War School in May of 2007, and then they sold their house and moved again. This time they moved south. Parker took a position in Tampa, Florida at MacDill Air Force Base. So with this, of course, there was increased responsibility, but there was also a significant pay raise. He was now earning over $100,000 a year, so it kind of felt like the good life. But despite this increase in income, the new warmer climate, and having the beach nearby, Julie's mental health continued on a downward trajectory. When the family first moved to Tampa, they rented a house while they shopped for a new home. And in May of 2008, they bought a two-story home in the upper middle class Ashley Reserve gated community. So this was a big house that cost close to half a million dollars. And they were able to put $90,000 down with a mortgage for the remaining cost. So they had managed to save some money. Apparently. But they're still going to have a mortgage of four hundred grand. That's a chunk of change. It's a lot, yes. But he was moving up and would certainly be making more money. Sure. Because he really wanted to become a general. After they had lived in Tampa for some time, Julie became fascinated with the writings of New Age author Eckhart Tolle. His book, A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose, was one of the Oprah Book Club selections. Despite its popularity, Time magazine, in a review, referred to its philosophies as spiritual mumbo-jumbo. Theologians pointed out that his work was dangerous because he did not distinguish between humans and God. 
Psychiatrists were afraid that his teachings could have a dangerous effect on the mentally ill because people with mental health issues often are easily misled by religious and spiritual teachings. So it's not clear if the writings influenced Julie's psychosis, which was already present with her schizoaffective disorder, but her depression continued once they were in Tampa. She continued to have up and t- ups and downs, and she continued to be non-compliant with her medications. When her depression was at its worst, she would take to her bed for the day, and even several days at a time. She was lethargic, she ignored housekeeping, and she ignored mothering responsibilities. But she still had her good moments, taking the kids to their sporting events, singing along with them to the latest pop songs in the car. Oh yeah, ups and downs. Oh, certainly, yes. Then in 2009, the Schenekers were pretty comfortable in their new home. They'd acclimated. The children had adapted to their new schools and made friends with classmates. And even Julie made a group of friends. She played tennis, went to women's lunches, and these women got together to celebrate each other's birthdays. One good friend to Julie was a woman named Lorraine, and she and Julie became very active in working for charitable causes, including raising money for nonprofits like the Muscular Dystrophy Association. So I would think there's a certain amount of responsibility being a colonel's wife. Things are expected of you. And that was a lot of pressure for her. Yeah, well, when you say things are expected, social things. Right, exactly. Right. Charities, dinners, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and those, those might not be situations that Julie could deal with very well. No, it seemed difficult. She pulled it off, but how long can you pull that off? She would be doing some of these things and then... She might go to bed for three weeks and refuse to get out of bed. And then her husband would just say, Julie's sick. Yep. So that October, Julie traveled back to Iowa for her college basketball team reunion. So to her old friends, she seemed different from the energetic Julie that they had known. She seemed to be distracted and kind of had a vacant look in her eyes. And she was very reserved, not the bubbly Julie they'd known. So this wasn't the same Julie they'd partied with five years earlier at another reunion. But Julie didn't say that anything was wrong. And she did participate in conversations. She shared her children's accomplishments with people. But she never went into anything in depth. And she just didn't seem very happy. Bo attended the middle school. And he was an excellent soccer player often referred to as an amazing goalkeeper. He also liked to play video games with his friends. He was an easygoing kid, like a lot of boys his age, and he liked to play Call of Duty. But he also got decent grades, not excellent grades, but he passed his classes. Calix was more academically driven than her brother, and adjusting to her new school took a little bit longer for her. But eventually she was really happy and she was accepted into an honors level program. And then she became part of a group of four girls who all loved the Harry Potter books and movies. Now, Calix, who had traveled all over the world, was fascinating to the other girls because they'd spent their entire lives in Tampa. So she led them in starting up their own Harry Potter fan club. And all her girlfriends knew Bo, and Parker was almost always away on assignments. But Calix didn't speak much about her mother. Usually, if the girls needed a ride somewhere, Parker was the one who showed up. When he was at home, he was the parent who supported school projects and took the kids out for celebrations and dinners and events with their friends. So Julie's lack of involvement snowballed when Calix no longer wanted to even ask her for anything. Julie really couldn't be counted on, and she was often angry, especially if last-minute plans were just thrust upon her. So when Parker was away out of town, Calix tried to just get along with her mother the best she could. Julie grounded her a lot, though, and Calix tried not to set her off. But sometimes it's like she couldn't help herself. She's a teenage girl. Her friends didn't know the extent of the problems or the conflicts between Julie and Calix. But the girl's parents seemed to know that there were some problems in the Schenecker home. As things continued to deteriorate, Calix spoke with her dad about applying to boarding schools. 
And they talked about it and he thought, you know, that's probably a good idea because she's a good student. She could get an excellent education at a boarding school and it might allow things to cool down between her and her mother because they were fighting a lot. Now, as 2010 started, Julie was plunging deeper into her depression. She was withdrawing from her friends and family. She went through a series of surgeries and suffered from blood clots. Then she became addicted to painkillers, mostly oxy. The drug abuse only worsened her mental condition. Parker knew that she was taking narcotics and drinking heavily at home during the day. He made her promise not to drive the car with the kids. So what do you think there? If you knew that I was taking drugs and drinking all day, and we had kids, young teens and preteens, I guess, at that point, what would you do? Would you just tell me not to drive the car? Or would you put me in a program? I don't know. It just seems like he's not putting enough importance on this problem. It doesn't seem to be. It's simple in a sense to say, don't do this, and you promise, okay, I won't do it. That lasts for maybe an hour. I think if she wasn't in a program, I would want her in a program, obviously. And, you know, he's he's a colonel. He's got money. So why don't we hire someone, sort of a in-house nanny or something like that? Hmm. Well, that's an interesting idea. And she can drive the kids around and do stuff. Well, I think family members did pitch in and do that quite often. But... I just kind of wonder if there was some embarrassment here and he didn't want people to know his wife was mentally ill, which wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, it wouldn't, but the way she's described, I'm sure all her friends and acquaintances knew that she had some mental health issues. Probably, yeah. You could only fool people for so long. Right. So October 2010, Calix was driving home from a cross-country practice with Julie in the passenger seat. They stopped at a store, and Julie waited in the car while Calix ran inside. When Calix returned with her bag of purchases, Julie peeked inside of it, and Calix snapped at her, telling her, Don't look in my bag. And Julie responded by backhanding Calix across her face. Then she continued to slap her daughter repeatedly. So Calix kept this incident to herself until she went into counseling. And she told her counselor about this incident, and the counselor reported the incident to the police. Days later, investigators visited the Scheneker home to investigate this alleged child abuse. There was no visible injury on Calix. She told the investigators that her mother had never hit her like that before. She normally just took away privileges or grounded her. So Calix had been hoping for a solution to her conflicts with her mother by reporting this incident to her counselor, but she would be disappointed because according to the Tampa police force, parents can discipline their children using physical force as long as there's no resulting injury. So because of that, no criminal charges were brought against Julie. Yeah, it looks like things are going downhill by late 2010. In November, Julie caused a two-vehicle collision. She was driving along 70 miles an hour in a 55-mile-per-hour zone. Her car approached a landscaping truck with a trailer full of mowers and other yard equipment, and she didn't stop. Either she didn't see the truck or she just didn't react in time. When her car hit the vehicle, the trailer came unhitched and rolled into oncoming traffic. This could have been a major problem. People could have been killed. Julie showed signs of being impaired, according to the police officer at the scene. She was described as having dilated pupils that didn't respond to light, and her speech was described as mush-mouthed. She was taken to the hospital to get blood alcohol and drug levels drawn, but she left before the tests were done. Now, it was strongly believed that she had been intoxicated from alcohol and oxy. There's no way to prove it. Yes, so she really didn't get the kind of consequence she should have from this. The accident did injure the people in the landscaping truck, and it also caused over $25,000 in damages. Julie was cited for careless driving, ordered to pay a small fine, and she had to attend traffic school. But there really would have been so much steeper consequences if her substance abuse had been substantiated at the scene. Parker knew that Julie had likely been impaired at the time of the crash, and he had told her over and over not to drive under the influence. But this incident really brought to the forefront the danger that she was posing 
to herself and to other people. So that time, Parker kicked Julie out of the house. She spent two nights in a local hotel. Then Parker picked her up and drove her straight to a rehab facility. Julie would spend three weeks there getting treatment for prescription drug abuse. While she was away, the household was peaceful and the children felt safe. Parker's mother, Nancy, stayed with the kids to help out. Also, while Julie was away, Parker called her doctor to get advice on what to do when she returned home. But because of HIPAA privacy rules, the doctor wouldn't talk to him. So he would complain about that later, that he really wasn't getting the information he should have had. I think that's legitimate if your partner is severely mentally ill, there should be some way for you to at least know what you need to know to keep your partner and yourself safe. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't think that HIPAA applied for spouses. Oh, yeah, I think it does. It has to because if women want to get some kind of gynecological care, they shouldn't have to check with their husbands, and the husband shouldn't be able to find out what she's done. So there has to be privacy in that, even from spouses. Okay. Unless you sign a form. Right. But Parker was really frustrated. He didn't know how to deal with her. On December 3rd, just days before she was to be discharged from rehab, Parker sent her an email. What he was hoping to do is convince her that allowing her doctors to share medical information with him would help out the whole family. So he did ask her to sign the release form. Julie's response was not helpful and really a bit childish. Hell no, she responded. Sorry about your luck. (laughs) So I'm trying to consider her illness here, but she also just sounds like kind of a mean person. Well, she's always been a person who speaks her mind. Yeah, yeah. And uh, didn't suffer fools very well. Which is fine. So, yeah. But this is her husband who's trying to take care of her, I would imagine. Nobody knows exactly what was happening in the home, but it seems like he was trying to help and she was just brushing him off. And that's where we get back to maybe she had some resentments. Yeah. But things quickly returned to the way they had been when Julie returned home. She went right back to drinking to excess and taking Oxycontin. And at this point, she cut off all contact with friends and family. That was different than before. She didn't even show any desire to communicate with Parker or her own kids. Now she was spending up to 20 hours a day in bed, just severely depressed. And abusing substances, which certainly doesn't help. On December 6th, she wrote an email to Parker. She told him about an upcoming appointment with a mental health counselor and asked him if she should bring the children with her. In his response, he criticized her for spending so much time in bed and not being a more involved parent. He told her that she was sealing her own fate with the kids. Family counseling was needed, but it would take a long time to heal their wounds. So he ended the email, I must protect them. They are telling me they feel unsafe. This is a basic responsibility of a parent, especially a father. They have asked their father for protection. The hard part of this is that they're asking for protection from their mother. So that kind of sums up how he's seeing the situation. And he does seem to be aware that there are risks. Well, certainly. In the weeks leading up to Christmas, Julie still had pretty low energy. But otherwise, life in the Stenecker household was more or less peaceful. On Christmas Day, Julie got out of bed and opened gifts with the rest of the family. Then she and Calix prepared dinner. Now, that's good, but this was the first year that Julie had not participated in decorating the house or buying any gifts or really interacting at all. Well, Parker, as a military man, seemed to think that Julie should just solve these issues through willpower and determination and strength. He really wasn't looking at past behaviors as predictors of future behaviors. And also, he may have been in denial about just how serious Julie's mental illness had become. In early January of 2011, the Schenekers went to an Al-Anon meeting for families, and Calix tried to speak to the group, but she just fell into tears and sobs and couldn't speak. On January 11th, Parker was given orders for a 10-day deployment to Afghanistan. He had concerns about leaving Julie alone with the kids, but he discussed it with her. 
He wanted to know if she could handle things while he was away. So she looked him right in the eyes and she told him, I've got this. Now he knew she was depressed, but she'd been depressed before. He was kind of used to that. And this didn't seem any different to him. So instead of asking for a delay from his commanding officers or asking a family member to come and stay with Julie and the kids, he just planned to go ahead with the deployment and leave Julie with the kids. And I think his trip was January 19th to February 1st, right around there. But the family celebrated Julie's 50th birthday together on January 13th. They went to a nice restaurant. And according to what Parker would later say, Julie seemed absolutely fine that night. On January 14th, Julie's brother Dave sent her an email. He wished her a belated happy birthday, and he told her his family would be visiting during spring break. He knew that his sister suffered from depression and hoped the upcoming trip might make her feel better, give her something to look forward to. The next day, which was January 15th, Parker sent an email to his and Julie's family, as well as a few close friends. What he wrote was a a response to some criticisms he had gotten for his decisions in how to deal with Julie. In the email, he expressed appreciation for everyone's concern and for their willingness to come to his home in emergency situations. But then he berated them for being judgmental of his decisions and his handling of family issues. So he asked them to give some thought to the issues he was facing. So I wanted you to just read a little highlighted area of that email because it's really interesting. Yeah, he writes, Julie was broken before I met her. She knew beforehand but did not tell me. As a result, he said, he'd spent more than 20 years taking on more burden in the relationship than he had expected. He then asked a series of questions. Have you ever lived with someone with bipolar disorder? Have you ever lived with a 50-year-old who has the judgment of a 10-year-old? Have you ever lived with an alcoholic or addict? I've lived with two of them. Have you ever had to deal with your spouse hitting you in front of your children? Have you ever had to deal with your spouse hitting your child in the face while your child was driving the car? Did you stay in that relationship, or did you leave? For those who answered they had stayed, he wrote that they had his respect and sympathy and asked for their insight on the problems they had faced. He ended with, I don't need folks taking shots or lobbing grenades over the wall at me or my children. I don't want your pity, but I deserve your respect. What I don't deserve is your judgment. Just remember, the most obvious and simple solutions work in math, but usually not in human relationships. So somehow, Julie got word that there was an email, but she didn't know what it said. She questioned family members, but no one would tell her what it was about. So her thoughts kind of ran away with her, and she decided that Parker was planning to file for a divorce. Her brother Dave refused to send her Parker's email, and any time she asked about it, he just changed the subject. He also told her that her emails had become incoherent and nonsensical. He asked her why she wasn't grateful that her family kept taking her back and why she didn't appreciate all that Parker did for her. He basically told her it would be her fault if Parker didn't make general. He said that he was willing to travel to Florida to help her with the kids, but he wouldn't come there just to run errands and drive them around for her while she got drunk. So the brother is a little bit sick of the problems with Julie. Kind of losing his patience with her is what I got out of that. Yeah, well, when I read the letter, it it seems to me that Parker deeply resents his wife not telling him of her mental problems before they were married. Yeah, but the brother's email, I was thinking, had kind of lost patience with her. Yeah, well, I think the whole family had. Sure, that's a good point, yes. So Parker was scheduled to leave for Afghanistan on January 19th, and return on February 1st, before he left the Florida Department of Children and Families, made their decision that Calix and Bo Scheneker were safe in their own home, and the abuse investigation from that slapping incident was closed. Once at his destination, Parker sent an email to the family to let them know he'd arrived and everything was okay. He'd be traveling to several different locations in Afghanistan over the next several days, so it wouldn't always be easy to reach him. Meanwhile, back at home, Julie was just going completely off the rails. She wrote in her journal about her kids. They are disrespectful, and I'm going to take care of it. 
she wrote that there would be a Saturday massacre. Her plan was to kill the children to stop them from mouthing off to her. What the fuck? That's crazy. Well, she's mentally ill and not taking her medication. And you think that's all there is to that? You don't think she's a bad person, too? Because I don't have a lot of empathy, I have to tell you. Well, it's always tough to separate all that stuff out, but no, I'd be willing to cut her some slack because of her mental illness. Cut her the slack of murdering people? Well, no, for having those thoughts. Okay. So that Saturday, January 22nd, after taking Calix and Bo back and forth to cross country and soccer, she left them at home and she went out to run an errand. Julie traveled between 45 minutes to an hour to go to Lock and Load Gun Store in Oldsmar, Florida. There were several closer gun stores, but she likely didn't want to be seen by someone she knew. And her husband, Parker, had a rule. No firearms in the house. He had teenagers in the house, he had a young boy, and he had a wife with severe problems. So you don't need a gun in that mix. Sounds like a good idea. So Gerald Tanzo, the gun shop owner, and his assistant, Ralph Monaco, were behind the counter when Julie arrived. She was buzzed in, and she approached the counter, smiling. Julie said, I want to purchase a handgun because there have been four or five home invasion robberies in my subdivision recently, and I need some protection. She told them she wanted to buy a revolver, adding that her husband was in the military and he was deployed away from home for 30 days. She said that she had been in the military for five years, stationed in Germany, and she'd loved it there. Julie pointed to the weapons in the case that caught her eye, and Monaco pulled out three different guns and put them on the counter for her to see. So she handled all three and appeared familiar with how to use each one. Now, according to these men that were at the gun store, Julie spoke very calmly with no signs of nervousness. She spoke clearly and she selected a Smith & Wesson Blue Steel 38 caliber snub-nosed revolver. She filled out the required paperwork and her writing was legible, but quite sloppy. So this paperwork required her to answer several questions. Are you the actual buyer of the gun? She said, yes. Are you under indictment in any court for a felony? She checked no. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? She checked no. Are you a fugitive from justice? She checked no. Are you an unlawful user of or addicted to marijuana or any depressant, stimulant, narcotic drug or any other controlled substance. So here's where she lied when she checked no. Then another question was, have you ever been adjudicated mentally defective or have you ever been committed to a mental institution? And she lied again there saying she had not. She's ready to get the gun and get busy with her plans for the Saturday massacre. However, she is really disappointed to learn that she couldn't take the revolver with her when she left because there's a waiting period, and this is in order for the approval of the purchase by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Julie was former military herself, married to a full colonel who was on deployment in Afghanistan. So to her, this seemed to be an unfair and just irrational rule that she'd have to wait to take her gun home. But too bad, no choice. So she paid for the handgun with her credit card and went home. People who talked to her that day said she was articulate and seemed perfectly normal. And once back home after her trip to the gun store, Julie pulled out the journal she had kept in a blue spiral notebook and wrote, The massacre will have to be delayed. So her brother, Dave Powers, sent her another email on Sunday. He asked her to respond to the points he had shared in his previous email. He wrote, I would like your response to each and every item. Please respond. So he's getting pretty harsh with her, and we don't really know why. I'm sure he had gone through a lot with her, though. Like you said, everybody had. But Calix and Bo both realized that their mother was mentally unwell. They'd been dealing with it since they were little kids. Bo wrote an email to a friend and told him, My mother's mentally unstable. So Parker communicated with the kids via email and Skype. Although Julie was far from emotionally and mentally healthy, she didn't seem any worse than she usually was. So he's not really worried. 
So on Monday morning, January 24th, Bo overslept. He missed his ride to school, so he woke up Julie and asked her to drive him. Julie told him that she didn't feel like it. She spoke with a friend later that day and told her that she was forgetting things. She rattled off a list of the medications she was taking, including lithium, hydrocodone, Percocet, and Oxycontin. So her friend encouraged her to speak with her doctor, but Julie kind of blew that off. She was very noncommittal. Didn't seem like she was going to do that. On Tuesday, January 25th, Calix spoke to her mother about a mandatory meeting that Julie had to attend. With a kind of a typical snotty teenager tone, Calix yelled at Julie, Get your shit together. Put on some makeup. Dress better. She called her mother pathetic and an evil soul. That night, Julie wrote in her journal, The evil starts Thursday. So our sponsor today is Apostrophe, a prescription skincare company for people who are ready to take their acne seriously. And I really like this company. I'm a matter of fact type person. I don't go in for untested products, especially when it comes to something as important as my skin. Prescription acne treatment can be really hard to get. You have to take time off of work, see a doctor, and line up at the pharmacy to get the actual medication. Well, no more. With Apostrophe, it's easy to be seen by a board-certified dermatologist online. You'll get treated immediately, and your medications are delivered right to your home. So this is so easy to do. It took me about 15 minutes, and my prescription was in my mailbox within three days. Just fill out Apostrophe's online questionnaire about your skin concerns and your medical history. Then you snap a few selfies for the dermatologist. Your dermatologist will get right back with you with a customized treatment plan specifically worked out for you. The best part is that Apostrophe offers topical and oral medications, so you can treat your acne from the inside out or from the outside in. Apostrophe treats acne, and they also help you hit your other skincare goals like redness, wrinkles, and my personal nemesis, dark spots. So my skin is about as fair as skin can get, and when I get some sun, I don't tan, I freckle. Apostrophe has helped me out with creams to lighten dark spots and also prevent adult acne outbreaks. It's so nice to know that a real dermatologist is developing your custom skincare plan. My tretinoin and niacin cream came in a little easy-to-use pump bottle with a cute postcard and actually some stickers to personalize my bottle. It's really easy and it's pretty cool. Get $15 off your first visit with a board-certified dermatologist at apostrophe.com forward slash TCB and use our code TCB. This code is only available for our listeners. So to begin, just go to apostrophe.com slash TCB and click on begin visit. Then use the code TCB at sign up and you'll get $15 off your dermatology visit. That's A-P-O-S-T-R-O-P-H-E dot com slash TCB. And don't forget to use the code TCB to get your dermatology visit for $15 off. Thanks, Apostrophe, for sponsoring this podcast. And while we're here, I just want to take a quick moment to remind you, our listeners, about our premium show, True Crime Brewery Premium. Pretty clever name, huh? I came up with that. I was going to say I did. Never mind. (laughs) But subscribing is a clever thing to do. By subscribing at tiegrabber.com, You can get your TCB episodes commercial-free, plus enjoy an extra ad-free bonus episode each and every month. But wait, there's more. You also get a TCB gift of your choice, a handwritten thank you note, and some miscellaneous TCB swag. So if this sounds like something you might enjoy, just go to tiegrabber.com, click on subscribe to see your options. Subscribing is a great way to support the show while getting some bonus and ad-free shows for yourself. Check it out. So that Wednesday, January 26th, Parker Skyped with Bo and Calix. Bo was using his new laptop. Both of them seemed really happy and relaxed. Neither expressed any concerns about their mother's behavior while he was gone. So Parker felt reassured again, and he had no immediate worries about his children's safety. But on Thursday, January 27th, Julie returned to the lock and load, and she picked up her gun. She seemed normal, calm, 
even articulate. She also bought some hollow point bullets. She loaded the gun and put it into her purse. When she got home, she wrote in her journal about the planned killing of her children. So Bo jumped into the minivan with Julie. She was supposed to take him to soccer practice. So he sat in the passenger seat preparing for his 7 p.m. practice. Before they got to the soccer field, Julie pulled out her gun and fired into the windshield. Understandably, this really freaked Bo out. Now, none of us will ever know what Bo was thinking or what he said to his mother. He told her to put the gun away or he'd punch her, and this is according to later interviews with Julie. But his words just pissed her off even more. She raised the gun and aimed it at Bo's head, pulled the trigger, and shot him through his left forehead. Oh, that's just... Every time I hear about it, it shocks me. It makes me sick to my stomach. So instead of parking the van outside the garage like she normally did, Julie pulled into the garage, closed the door behind her, and then shot Bo a second time. This time fired the bullet into his brain through his mouth. But she wasn't done. Calix was next. Calix was wearing an orange Florida High School Athletic Association t-shirt and green shorts with white stripes. And she was sitting on a rolling office chair doing her homework, focused on the computer screen. So engaged in her work, Calix heard the noise echoing from downstairs as the garage door rose in its tracks and the car pulled inside. Now, so she was probably likely aware of the sounds her mother made as she re-entered the home. Now, maybe it's possible that Calix had hoped that if she just looked busy, her mother wouldn't bother her, because she didn't want to argue with her and she didn't turn around to look at her when Julie entered the room. Yeah, so I just wonder, what did Calix think the sound of the gunshot was? Yeah. Did she have something to think about there? I don't know. I mean, didn't have a silencer or anything. No, and it was right in the garage. Yeah. I don't know. That's one thing that's kind of a mystery to me that she didn't hear that. Yeah, I know. But Julie stared at her daughter's back and raised the revolver. Calix didn't have any idea that her mother was just out of control and preparing to kill her. She'd already killed her little brother. Julie fired, shooting her in the back of her head. The impact sent Calix's head off to the side, but Julie pulled the trigger again, and this time she shot Calix in the face, just below her mouth. And her actions after the second murder suggest that either Julie had some remorse or she was completely out of her mind. Pulling the chair Calix had been sitting in, holding her bleeding body upright, Julie rolled it off the plastic floor protector, across the white carpet, and down the hallway to her daughter's bedroom. So there's a double trail of blood from the chair's wheels, marking the path from one room to the other. When Julie was in Halix's bedroom, she lifted her body out of the chair and laid her on the bed. She placed her daughter's bleeding head on a pillow. Then she went to the linen closet and got a blanket. When she was back in Calix's bedroom, she placed the blanket over her. She rolled the desk chair back to the den, pushed it back under the desk. Then she went back to the closet again and got another blanket. When she turned off the lights on the second floor, went back downstairs and into the garage. She opened the front passenger door of the minivan, removed Bo's blood-stained glasses from his face, and set them on the dashboard. Then she covered Bo's body with a blanket. So, even though those blankets over the bodies does show some possible regret, her next email that she sent to her husband was strange, and depending on how you think about it, I think it could be cruel. She wrote to him, get home soon, we're waiting for you. So she could have been angry, or she could have entered complete denial of what she'd done. Her next email, telling Parker about the children's grades, was another possible sign of denial about these murders. But the email was oddly worded with many misspellings. Still, unfortunately, that had become the norm for Julie, because she was always high and had those other issues. So that night, Julie sent an email to her mother and her siblings. She wrote that she was tired of the kids talking back, but added it would all be over soon. She didn't tell them about killing the kids. But no matter, because nobody read that email until the next morning. Then after she sent the email, Julie went out by the pool. And sitting there, she chain-smoked, drank, and wrote down an account of what she had done. She wrote out in detail why she had done it, too and also said that she planned to take her own life. Now this, 
according to police reports, was just an unemotional, straightforward retelling of the events. Yeah, so I guess her original intent was to shoot herself, but after killing her children and seeing how violent that was, she decided she would overdose on medication to save herself the pain and the violence of a shooting. So right there, I hate her guts. I mean, how do you explain that? You're okay with shooting your children, but then you don't want to do it to yourself because, you know, it might hurt. (laughs) Right. Just evil. So she'd been a carpool mom taking turns driving kids to school each day. To keep the other parents away, she left post-it notes on her front door saying, we went to New York City, be back on Tuesday. So they had one of those big family calendars. You know, it's kind of like the kind people put on their desks sometimes. Yeah. And this family had one to keep track of all their events because it's a busy family. And on this family calendar, on the date of Parker's planned return, she wrote, Sorry about your parking space. Had to leave it for Bo, my darling precious child. She also wrote on the calendar, Bo is in the van on the way to practice. Calix is in the bed. Try to make her comfortable. So what do you even make of that? Well, she's getting ready to kill herself, right? Yes. So it's final notes. Well, they're crazy, though, I mean. What do you think about what she said? We've already established that she's stark raving mad. Yes, but did she know what she did? I think she did. She did. So I don't think she was legally insane. But we'll get to that. So on the patio... In her pajamas and a robe, Julie took a large dose of both Coumadin and lithium. Her intent was to die from an overdose. Although the Coumadin, I guess maybe you could bleed. Yes, you can. Well, isn't that what rat poison is? It's Coumadin, so you bleed to death. Yeah. Yeah. That Thursday evening, Calix's best friends got on their laptops to watch The Office TV show and watch it together. When Calix didn't show up, they just assumed she had gone to dinner with her family Or maybe she had fallen asleep early. So the next morning was January 28th, and Julie's mother, Patty, checked her email. And when she read the message from Julie, she was frightened. (laughs) Good. Yeah. Her complaints about Calix and Bo and her conclusion that it would all be over soon were signs that her daughter's depression was worse, and she thought maybe she's suicidal. Patty tried calling Julie, but got no answer, And then she tried calling her grandchildren's cell phones, but neither of them answered. And this was a really ominous sign. So Patty called the Tampa PD and asked them to check on her daughter and her grandchildren. Two Tampa police officers arrived at the Schenecker home in order to conduct a welfare check. So they saw the post-it notes on the front door, but they knocked. Nobody answered, so they looked through a window and they could see clear through to the back of the house. And that's where the sliding glass door was open. They walked around the house to the backyard and entered the screened enclosure surrounding the pool. There they saw Julie lying on the cement. There were pool toys, chemicals, and cigarette butts nearby. So from the pool area, you could enter the house through those sliding doors. Julie was what they called semi-conscious. She was wearing a white bathrobe splattered with a lot of blood, Her face, too, was speckled with blood spatter, and she also had a dusting of black powder on her face. So after they checked Julie for injuries to see where that blood was coming from, the officers asked if they could go inside and check on her children, because now they're really worried. There's a lot of blood on her, and where are the kids? So she agreed, and they helped her inside. The formal living room was still decorated for Christmas. No one had taken down the tree or anything, even though it was the end of January. And there were still wrapped packages that had never been delivered to family and friends. In the kitchen, the sink was filled with dirty dishes. A serving bowl with an old piece of chicken sat next to a plate with another piece of old chicken and a fork. A yellow post-it note there read, Calix wouldn't eat the French chicken. Was going to make something else? Question mark. In the garbage can, there were three empty Heineken bottles and two empty wine bottles. A purse sat on another kitchen counter, and inside that, there was a receipt from January 22nd for the 38 caliber Smith & Wesson handgun and a box of ammunition from Lock and Load. So Julie wasn't offering them any information, but she did agree to let them look for the kids. In the master bedroom, they found a disheveled bed, 
with a prescription bottle for clonazepam, which is an anti-anxiety hypnotic, which can cause drowsiness and even cognitive impairment, right? Absolutely. And sleep was handwritten across the label, which I find kind of funny, not funny, haha, funny, weird. Like she couldn't even take the time to look at what the medication was because she's in this stupor all the time. Yeah. There was also a blue spiral notebook, a flower-topped ink pen, and a cell phone. And later that notebook would be determined to be filled with Julie's murder plans. It's where she'd written a lot of stuff down that made it look like she knew exactly what she was doing. And on the nightstand, there was an empty Heineken bottle and an empty prescription bottle of hydrocodone which is a narcotic pain medication. There were other empty and partially filled bottles of antipsychotic medications, including lithium and triazolam. All of the labels had Julie's name on them. The handgun was also on a dresser. One of the officers emptied it of ammunition and secured it. The box of ammunition was in the master bedroom next to five empty casings. Bathroom. The box of ammunition was in the master bathroom, next to five empty casings, one of Parker's business cards, and six more prescription bottles with Julie's name on it. There was a large amount of blood in the upstairs computer room. That's where Calix had been shot. Following the trail of blood, an officer entered Calix's room and found her body on the bed. She was covered with the blanket. So when he pulled the blanket back, her face was covered in blood and her body was already cold and stiff. So he moved on, checking the other bedroom and bathroom, just hoping that he might find Bo alive and hiding somewhere in the house. It's not looking good at this point. No, it isn't. And there were post-it notes all over the house. One read, do not resuscitate. So we don't know if that was for her when she tried to overdose, maybe. Well, but I would assume. Yes. She knows the two kids are dead. Right. But does she? Yes. Okay, well, some of the things she said and written don't match that. But downstairs through the laundry room, the officer entered the three-car garage, and a chalkboard on the garage wall had a message written on it, 2011, best year ever. So that was a little bit upsetting, a a little ironic. So there was a white Honda minivan and a black Volkswagen Passat in the garage, and he stopped in his tracks when he saw the minivan's windshield had a bullet hole in it and he could tell it had been shot from the inside of the vehicle out. The front passenger seat of the minivan was covered with a white blanket. The side window was covered with blood spatter. So the officer shone a flashlight through the window and saw a human leg, opened the driver's side door, reached through, and moved the blanket. There was a fatal gunshot wound and a huge amount of blood on the left side of the boy's face. White fluid had foamed around his nostrils. But he had his seatbelt on, and that was holding him upright. So he's not breathing, there's no rise or fall of his chest, there's no pulse, and he too was very cold and very stiff. Back inside the house, the police asked Julie for the dates of birth of her children, and she was able to tell them that. After taking a statement from her, they arrested her, and they let her out from her house, which now is being blocked off as the scene of a double homicide. It's not the kind of neighborhood where you would expect anything like this. Although in what neighborhood would you expect it, to be honest? Exactly. Yeah. Now, in the evening of this tragedy at the Schenecker home, everyone came to Hampton Park. Friends of Calix and Bo, neighbors of the family, teachers, friends of Parker and Julie, close to 200 people, many dressed in black, gathered at the park to honor the memory of the two teens whose lives were taken in two calculated acts of violence. In the meantime, Julie had been taken to jail for processing. After fingerprinting, photos, and other necessary paperwork were completed, she was moved in with the 3,300 inmates at the Falkenberg Road Jail. She would remain in custody there until her bond hearing, but she was shaking so badly that she was taken to Tampa General Hospital. Yeah, I guess she had tardive dyskinesia from some of the antipsychotropics. Yeah. And that's some kind of neurological problem that they cause, which you can't fix. No, you can't. So she was just shaking uncontrollably, we believe. Yeah, well, and it also could be that she's shaking uncontrollably from what she's done. Eh, 
I don't buy that at all, Dickie. Okay. Maybe some of the stuff's starting to wear off and she's having some withdrawals because that's going to happen. Yeah. So Julie was scheduled to appear in court the next morning, but the hearing had to be delayed while she was being treated at the hospital. Yeah, of course, her room was guarded by the police. Well, yeah. You can't just have her on her own there. Not where she could just leave. Yeah, or hurt herself, or who knows. Yeah. But Sunday morning, Julie was released from the hospital and transported back to the jail. She was held in a medical confinement cell at her own request, and she had no access to TV or newspapers. She could leave her cell for one hour each day to shower, go outside, or make a phone call. And that was it. The children's autopsies were done that day, and when they removed the clothing of Calix, there was nothing remarkable about it except blood staining. The medical examiner assessed the exterior of her body and noted a scar on the front of her right shoulder, but she had no tattoos. She had no recent injuries from before the murder either, just the two gunshot wounds. So the bullet wounds were described, including location, size, shape, and the path of the bullet and there were no exit wounds. So he did recover the two bullets. Both were in separate pieces, the jacket and the lead slug separated. So even though the cause of death seemed obvious, he continued the procedure with an analysis of all of her internal organs and found nothing, nothing unusual. The toxicology report ultimately reported no substances in her body either. So she wasn't taking any drugs or drinking or anything, which we kind of knew that anyway. She didn't do that stuff. We did. So next, they completed the autopsy of Bo, and the results were similar, but he did have one exit wound. The conclusions of both of the children's were the same. Cause of death, gunshot wound of the head with perforation of the skull and brain. Manner of death, homicide, shot by another person or persons with a handgun. So now poor Parker, regardless of if he was the best husband in the world, You have to be brokenhearted for him. He was notified that his wife had killed his children, and he was still in Cutter before he would be returning home. Parker hid his grief behind a stoic front, which was just definitely the way he was. He said, My wife has battled depression for more than 10 years and had checked herself into rehab centers several times in the past for substance abuse and alcohol. So he shook his head and he said, I knew she had depression issues, but I never thought she'd do something like this to our kids. And who would think that of a mother? No, mothers don't do that, right? No. So due to Julie's mental health history, the state attorney's office decided that the Supreme Court in Florida would not support a death sentence. And a jury was unlikely to sentence a person to death when there is such an extensive background of mental illness. So the trial was delayed until 2014. Part of the reason for this is the police had seized five computers from the Schenecker home, and they had extracted over one million files that needed to be looked at. And the defense also needed time to look through all these files. So it's going to be a while. When it finally moved forward, the prosecution sought a guilty verdict for double murder and life without parole for a sentence. The defense wanted a verdict of insanity and a sentence of time inside of a psychiatric unit. Yeah, so this case basically rested on whether she was mentally ill at the time of shooting her children to the degree that she didn't understand what she was doing or that her actions were wrong. But Julie's journal that had been found at the house on the night of the murders had entries written weeks beforehand and some written on the night after she had shot her children. And these were heavily scrutinized by both the prosecution and the defense. Entries from before the murders indicated that she had planned to kill her children and then herself so they wouldn't have to live with the stigma of a mother who killed herself. She also said that she was afraid the children had inherited her genes and that that would doom them to a life of struggles with mental illness. So she was saving them. So she was doing a good thing. Well, she said she was. (laughs) The defense pointed the blame at Parker because he knew his wife was sick, but still left her alone with the children when he went overseas. Julie's family said that he had refused help from family members, and he had put her into a rehab program in 2010 instead of where she really should have been, a psychiatric facility. 
But these journal entries gave the prosecution good evidence to argue that the murders of Calix and Bo were premeditated. The prosecution pointed out her entries where she had written that she planned a massacre. She also lied when she bought the gun. So this showed that she knew killing her kids was morally wrong and illegal. If she thought it was the right thing to do, why would she lie? According to the testimony, she moved Calix into her bed, tried to manipulate her face into a smile, and then covered her with a blanket. She said, she was not as easy because I rolled the chair by her clean bed. Bo is so cold and hard, I wish I could put him in my bed. That's where he slept happily. I just can't lift him. I sure wish I could. We're going home today. Take us home, Lord. So what do you think of that? So you think she knew what she was doing? Yeah. I think all those entries in her journal or whatever she was writing, she's talked about killing them because they were mouthy brats. Yep. I mean, she knew. She knew. Yeah, I agree. So after just two hours of deliberation on the 15th of May, 2014, the jury returned a verdict of guilty on both counts of first-degree murder, and she was sentenced to life with no possibility of parole. In 2015, one year after her conviction, Julie spoke to local ABC reporter Serena Fazan about the day she killed her children by shooting them both in the head and how she felt about it now. Julie's responses were really odd, often sounding as if she didn't know she'd killed them, and even saying that she'd seen them leave their bodies and fly up to heaven. But then there are other times in the interview when she sounded like she'd planned the murders because her kids were mouthy brats. She said she'd save them, but then she wouldn't say what she saved them from. So to me, yes, she's mentally ill. She totally was not right. But she also sounded dishonest. Yeah, nobody will dispute that she's mentally ill. But I think the eyes of the law, in a legal sense, she wasn't insane when she killed them. I agree. I think they got that right. Now, before the trial, Parker divorced Julie. He has told the media that he doesn't hate Julie. And following legal disputes over their financial assets mostly to limit how much money could be used to pay for Julie's defense and a request for half of the $2 million estate. Parker filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Julie. He claimed that his Florida wrongful death complaint was an effort to give his daughter and son a voice and hold their mother accountable for her actions. Well, yeah, she really uh, had some nerve. When he first saw Julie in jail, he told her that he planned on suing her for divorce and... She turned down his divorce settlement that he offered her. Julie filed her own response where she demanded half of his assets, alimony until her death, payment of her legal expenses, and she even wanted to keep her diamond ring. And then, just to top it off, she wanted him to buy a life insurance policy and make her the beneficiary. It's just too much. Too much to take. certainly is. So that was settled for an undisclosed amount. Parker created the Calix and Bo Scheneker Memorial Fund in honor of his two children. The Calix and Bo Memorial Fund promotes arts, athletics, and altruism in today's youth by giving out scholarships for future leaders, artists, and athletes. And he just seems to be incredibly strong, although I know he's the kind of person who's learned not to show emotion. But if you just see him, you know he's an army guy. You know, a military guy. Stiff upper lip. Yes, exactly. And I'd be a wreck. No kidding. So our sources, Julie Scheneker Criminal Trial is available to watch on YouTube. We also found official transcripts from her interview with the Tampa police. We read a book, Sleep My Darlings by Diane Fanning. And we also had the ABC News archives, including that interview and an article from the New York Times from March of 2011, Suburbs Veneer Cracks, and that was written by Erica Good. TCB's music was written and produced by Tristan Capel. If you love jazz, you'll love Tristan. Check out his website, tristancapel.com. If you have comments, a case suggestion, or even a beer recommendation, please send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com or even better yet, record a voicemail for a future show. Also, if you do enjoy listening to the show, we would really appreciate it if you would leave us a review 
on iTunes or whatever app you listen on. Okay, I got you some feedback, Julie. All right, let's go. We've got a couple voicemails and an email today. So the voicemail is from Jen with a case suggestion. Hi, Dick, and hi, Jill. I've um, contacted you before. My name's Jen, and I live in Australia on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. I love your podcast. I've only just discovered it. I've actually had it as a favourite for quite a while on my Podbean, but, you know, just started listening. Love beer, love stouts, so love, Dick, love your explanations of them. Just getting down to crime, so I did say before, I really like the Australian ones. I like all the American ones too. I find the backstories fascinating and just some people's lives, wow. Well, I am an RN and I worked in psych for a number of years in an acute unit, so I've seen quite a lot of stuff and forensic things. Just a couple of crimes. Um, A most recent one in Australia, Melissa Caddick. That's C-A-D-D-I-C-K. That is quite interesting. Still quite a mystery and an interesting lady. And the other one I wanted to talk about was Peter Falconio. So he and Joanne Lees went off in a combi in the middle of Australia in Northern Territory and he disappeared. She claims he was murdered. Someone was convicted of it and he's still saying he was innocent to watch. Uh, There is a book called Murder in the Outback, I think it's called, by Robin Bowles, or B-O-W-L-E-S, or is it? No, it's Death in the Outback by Robin Bowles. Fascinating book, and she's very sceptical about who Joanne says murdered Peter. Nobody has ever been found. And the other one, oh, there is uh, some television shows called Murder in the Outback where they interview people. Uh, Also another case is Snowtown. That's some really creepy murders, body in the barrels type thing down in South Australia where there seems to be a lot of sinister stuff that goes on. It's a pretty place to visit, but maybe you wouldn't want to live there. (laughs) Anyhow, I'll sign off now and just saying I love the show and I am still listening to a lot from a couple of years ago. Um, And keep up the good work and have a beer for me. Bye. Thank you, Jen. Did it sound like there were chickens or something in the background? Something, yeah. Yeah. Crocodiles? <laughs> Quacks. <laughs> so the the other, the Falconio case and the Snowtown case, someone had talked about last week, which we discussed. So I was just paying attention to the Melissa Caddick case. And yeah, this, that's fascinating. This is a fascinating case. It's evolving because this is all brand new recent stuff. This woman disappeared in November 2020, and this was just after she had been charged with defrauding clients of $23 million in an investment Ponzi scheme. So she was presumably on the run. That is, until some people found a rotting foot in a sneaker that had been washed up on shore 400 kilometers from her home. And this was in February of this year. This is all as it's happening, basically. And DNA testing confirmed the identity as Caddick. So what happened to her? That's interesting. We'll have to follow that. Yeah, it's something that I think we'll need to be looking at. Okay. So our next voicemail is from Bex. Bex has written us before. Yeah, I remember that name. Hey, Dick and Jill. This is Bex, and I'm calling just to tell you two things. One is that the recent episode on Ellen Bohm, wow, that really stuck with me for a while. We did a great job on it. And if folks haven't listened, I highly recommend that episode. It was just fascinating. Also, I have an episode suggestion for you. I recently heard about this case out of Houston, Texas. Um, and one of the victims, her name was Gallery Bagazzati. I tried my best in pronunciation there. But um, just a really interesting story. And it actually took a while, it looks like, for the police to solve it um, because they were trying to figure out the motive. So thanks for all the great uh, podcast content and keep them coming. Thanks so much, Bex. That was nice. Yeah. She followed her voicemail with an email where she spelled out the name of uh, the one victim. So there's actually two people that were killed months apart. And in 2012, Ali Irsan killed Gilara Baghirzada, Cody Beavers. And these are considered honor killings. Cody was the husband of one of her son's daughters, and Baghirzada 
was kind of a friend advisor, and apparently Irsan felt like she was giving too much negative influence on his daughter, so she had to go. Wow. So he was convicted. He was sentenced to death in 2018. Then in 2019, with a plea bargain, he confessed to the murders, and the death penalty was taken off the table. So I do think the honor killings can be a fascinating topic. There's a lot of sociology involved in that, in the cultures that people are in. Yeah. And we haven't done one in a while, so that's probably a good one to look into. We'll check it out. Okay, now we have an email from Megan. And Megan writes, You two do a particularly sensitive job covering cases with children. There is a case from Wisconsin that I don't believe any other podcasters have covered. It's a horrible one, and I'd like to suggest it to you. I understand you're probably inundated with horrible cases from everywhere, every single day, and probably have a long list, but maybe you can look at this one. Thank you, Megan. Of course, Megan, we look into just about anyone that we get. So this is a guy who killed his three sons. Ooh. His name is Armin Wand, and his brother Jeremy helped him. They set his house on fire in 2012 with the intent of killing everybody in there because Armin wanted a fresh start. Oh, my God. So his three sons died in the fire. His wife and daughter survived. That's fucking awful. It's horrible. I don't know. I'll look at it some more. Okay. Yes. The ones about children have to be spread out. It's not something we can do constantly without becoming severely depressed and taking to our bed, right? Yeah. These are tough ones. They certainly are. Okay. Is that it for feedback? That's it. All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And of course, thank you for your feedback. We look forward to seeing you again soon at the quiet end. We'll be there. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.